Hello everybody and welcome to Parks Bros. It's Drew here and today I will be doing my full in-depth review of Gatekeeper at Cedar Point. Gatekeeper is a B&M wing coaster that is actually the first of its kind that I was able to ride and still is the only B&M wing coaster I've been able to ride. So I won't actually be able to compare this ride to any other wing coaster that I've been on because I haven't been on another wing coaster, but I will compare it to other B&Ms that I've ridden just as a heads up before we get this review going. But Gatekeeper is really an icon for the park, especially at the front entrance. It goes right over the front entrance twice with some beautiful looking inversions. This is definitely one of my favorite looking coasters at the park. It's got a beautiful color scheme of a dark blue and a light blue on the spine of the track and then some white supports. But in person, it's just super vibrant and it looks amazing. And it also helps that the track actually looks quite graceful itself, especially with the way the train moves throughout the track. But we'll get more into how it moves throughout the track a little later on in this review. But first, we got to figure out how to get there. And if you're at the front entrance, it's actually a lot harder than you'd think, especially with how half the ride is seemingly right next to you when you go under the so-called gate that it is keeping but once you enter through the front entrance you will have to go all the way down the main path to where max air is on the right it's actually past the raptor entrance on the left so once you pass raptors entrance on your left hand side turn to your right where you can see max air and then go right past max air and it should be right in the center of your view at that point in time. Now the lockers are actually on the left-hand side of the main entranceway. There is this beautiful looking main entranceway that actually doesn't really point to the ride too well, but it's got an awesome looking sign. But the lockers are on the left-hand side of that, so you'll need to drop off your bigger personal belongings there before you ride. And I'd actually recommend that you just drop everything there unless the wait is kind of long because you will not be able to bring pretty much most of your items into the line as well as up into the station and that's just because of how the loading and unloading process is for this ride you can bring glasses and like cell phones and wallets up to the station if you'd like i wouldn't recommend it just as a precaution if anything and honestly at cedar point i definitely recommend something like zipper pants or zipper shorts where you actually have zipped up pockets because on a good majority of the rides there as long as you have your personal belongings in zipper pockets you should be okay to ride and I think it's a little safer than putting your stuff in a small box with other people's phones and wallets and things and just personal items that could potentially be taken at some point in time. Now, of course, I've never actually had someone steal something from me from any of these boxes, but there is a chance of that wherever you go, obviously. But just know for sure, no backpacks in the station. But speaking of the station, let's figure out how to get there. Now, across the way from the lockers, and past that sign again on the right hand side, there is a small, very understated entranceway. It's just kind of plain and filled with concrete and some metal fencing. And that's about it for the entire theming of this ride, which is definitely prevalent in most of the rides up at the front half of Cedar Point. And it's kind of a shame to me because there could be some really cool just posters and interesting figures around especially with this theme that they've gone for with it being a griffin that is pretty much the protector of cedar point which i think is actually kind of cool in all honesty it's got a little bit of a mythical feel to it but it would have been nice to not have it just be concrete underneath the station that's right you're walking underneath the station too at least if the lines were shorter now the lines were incredibly short for us the entire trip the longest line we saw for it was probably 15 minutes and every time we rode it, we only waited, I think, max about three rotations. And at early entry, every time we looked at it for early entry, it was a complete walk on. And yes, this is probably the only ride that we actually marathoned because there was no line and that we had certain thoughts that I'll get to later in the video about. But I do believe this coaster was actually our most ridden coaster of the trip. I think I was somewhere in the range of eight rides or so, maybe even seven. But I think our second most ridden coaster was either Millennium Force or Steel Vengeance with about five. 
And I think Gemini was up there as well with about five rides or so. But anyways, once you get to a certain point in the line, it will actually ask you to choose a side, whether you want to be on the right or the left hand side. And I actually like how they have this set up. If you go to the right, it, you actually get on the right hand side of the train. If you go to the left, you actually get on the left hand side of the train. It's not really confusing, which is great because of course the only other coaster that has a type of loading system like this for me is X2 and it's really kind of hard to say whether you're on the right or left hand side because you start off going backwards and it's kind of weird. But it wouldn't surprise me if there's a grouper there on most days that it's kind of busier. But of course every day we were there we just walked to whatever side we wanted because the line never got past that point. Now, of course, once you pass that area, you do go up a flight of stairs on either side, and then you are into the station, and it's kind of free reign where you want to go. But where you end up meeting the station will be near the back, so don't be surprised if the back actually has a little bit of a line. But also don't be surprised if there's no line for the back at all. It's really kind of all over the place with how people decide where to ride on this ride. But of course, you know, the rows like four and five will rarely be filled up, at least if the line is quite short. But now that we're in the station, we are finally close enough to get a look at these beautiful trains. Some of the best looking trains I've ever seen in person. They are covered in this awesome looking gold, almost shield like and plate metal. And of course, on the middle of the front car, there is this amazing looking head of a griffin that actually has its eyes light up red, just like the main logo, which is awesome to see, especially at nighttime. But as someone new to the B&M vest restraints on my first ride, it was definitely kind of startling to see those restraints instead of the basic B&M over the shoulder restraints that I'm so used to on like inverts and floorless coasters around the world. But speaking of the restraints, once you sit down, the seat is actually kind of awkward. It leans back in a way, kind of like floorless trains do, where your legs are higher than your butt. And I always found that a little weird about B&M trains. That seems to be a common thing. And of course, in most trains that you'll sit by most manufacturers, your butt will be lower than your legs, but it's almost comical how much you can just slide back in your seat as you're first sitting down. It's almost a mini ride in its own sometimes. But besides that, the seats are quite comfortable themselves. I've never really had a problem with B&M seats in all honesty, except for, you know, friends potentially losing phones. So make sure you have your zipper pockets. But moving on to the restraint that you will pull over your shoulders and above your head, the vest was actually quite tight in what I thought it was going to be like. And I would actually say the vest restraint on Gatekeeper was tighter than the vest restraint on Valraven for me, which I found really interesting because I've always heard the worst about Valraven's restraints and nothing really bad about Gatekeeper's. So I found that really interesting that Gatekeeper's restraints were actually tighter, at least the vest portion on my collarbones than for Valraven's restraints. But of course, this restraint is actually quite similar to the ones they have on B&M flying coasters. So I have a lot of experience with Tatsu. And I definitely think I prefer the restraints a tiny bit on Tatsu a little more, but it is in a completely different position. But the main reason behind that is because the main lap bar portion for Gatekeeper does dig straight into my hip bones if I get stapled hard enough mid ride. So this isn't really a ride I'd actually have my hands up on. It's actually quite hard because of how the vest restraints are to raise your shoulders in any way. But this is definitely a ride I think I just hold the restraints or just have my hands down if anything, because it's just so hard to get your hands up in that confining vest restraint. And especially if you're trying to pull up on the restraint after being completely stapled to hell and back on this ride, which only happened I think once for me. And I think the stapling problem, at least with how my hips were feeling after the ride was worse on Valraven in all honesty. So I'd say the bottom of the vest restraint on Gatekeeper was better than the top and then the opposite for Valraven. But anyways, after taking your seat of choice, and I would actually say, just to start this off, the best seats for me are definitely the front right and the back left. Definitely believe the hype in those seats. But I did sit in some other seats besides that, like third to front on the left hand side or just kind of all over the place but I definitely found myself riding in the back left and the front right more than any other seats. And those were definitely my favorite spots to be. But with that, and once you've pulled the seat belt buckle up from betwixt your legs and you're all clearing out of here, you make a right-handed turn 
180 degrees to the lift hill and once you get up the lift hill you can see how gorgeous that view is from the front of the park especially where gatekeepers place especially if you're on the left hand side of the train you get this amazing view if you just turn your head about 45 degrees with lake erie as well as some distant ohio and it's really gorgeous to see in person and on the right if you turn your head well you get a view of a parking lot mainly but you can see the ride itself a lot better and it's a really cool view from that portion and especially if you can turn your head far enough to see like raptor going around and it's kind of harder to see like foul raven you really can't turn your head that far but still a cool view nonetheless but once you've crested this surprisingly tall lift hill you will go over the wing over drop and this is actually one of my favorite elements on the ride easily especially in the front right and the back left seats the front right definitely gives you some incredible hang time going down this drop because it is pretty much a dive loop but you go into it incredibly slowly and it actually looks like a pretzel loop but we'll get into that a little more later on but the hang time in the front right is just incredible you get a good two or three seconds of just complete weightlessness and then in the back left oh my gosh you get yanked over it it's weird because it does push you upwards and then all of a sudden you get thrown out of your seat because now you're inverted so it's it's really a bizarre drop but it's definitely one of my favorite drops i've ever experienced and one of my favorites at the park believe it or not like i definitely put this drop over some of the best rides in the park in my opinion but immediately after cresting that drop and then going to the bottom you will actually potentially gray out on most of my rides i ended up graying out in this section especially in the front right and it definitely felt like a pretzel loop that i was just sitting upright for and honestly it, it looks so close to a pretzel loop that it makes total sense but i was legitimately graying out especially in the front right the back left not nearly as much but man, it was way more forceful than I was expecting in that section of the ride. And then you go up in Immelman, which is awesome to experience, especially after being potentially grayed out. And then there's a quite graceful section that leads you into a floater airtime hill. And most of my rides, I did get quite great floater. I think the first ride I had on it was the best floater I experienced out of all my rides. But at the bottom of that Camelback Hill, there will be a photo section. So that's definitely where you want to pose. I actually couldn't get that down for my first three or four rides. But immediately after that, you do pull a little bit of an intense G-Force into going into a corkscrew element, which definitely had a little bit of whippage at the top, which I was not expecting. But I think that's just because of how wide the trains are. But once you've gotten to the bottom of that element after it being quite smooth up top it does have a little bit of a crunch at the beginning and the ending of this element and you will actually feel that a little more on the outside seats this definitely isn't the smoothest ride i've ever been on it wouldn't even be the smoothest ride at cedar point but honestly it's a little bit of rattle didn't hurt my experience at all it was just a little noticeable but there were a couple points throughout the ride that definitely had a little bit of a rattle and a little bit of crunch but immediately after that corkscrew type element, you'll be going over the main element of the ride, and that is a zero G roll over the front entrance and through two keyhole near miss elements, which are fantastic, especially on the right hand side in the front. I think that's probably my favorite seat, but it definitely feels like you get closer to hitting everything in the right hand side, especially with coming back around, but we'll get to that a little later on. But compared to the left front and the right front, I definitely say the right front seems like you're closer to hitting some of those near miss elements. Whereas on the left, it didn't feel too close in all honesty. But the zero G roll itself is quite awesome. But honestly, I don't remember it too well, but that's because I was focusing on the keyhole element so much going, oh, how close am I? How close am I? And then passing by and not really realizing that I went completely upside down at that point in time. But I think it's really just a standard zero G roll, if anything. It wasn't anything crazy in my mind. But after that, you will get a little more crunch as you're getting to the bottom of that valley. And then you'll encounter, I think it's an inclined dive loop, which is really just kind of a diving turnaround, which this element didn't do too much for me in all honesty. But it does give a really cool view of Blue Streak, especially on the right hand side of the train. But after that, you'll go over an 
inline twist again next to those keyhole elements which does give an amazing near miss element with its own supports on the right hand side of the train now whether i prefer the zero g roll or the inline twist uh, i don't really know i'd probably say the zero g roll because there are technically two head choppers you could get whereas on the inline twist you can only really get one the other being a leg chopper but then after that awesome inversion you will go up into a mid-course brake run, which I actually didn't mind too much. At that point in the ride, I was like, you know what? It's been long enough. It's had the elements that I've really adored. But after a mini trim, probably, depending on how many trains are running at the time, you will go into a helix section. And actually, that was a lot more forceful than I was expecting. And I did get some good floater, especially in the back for this element. But the helix felt like a proper helix that actually was quite forceful. And I know B&M ends their rides on a lot of helixes after mid-course brake runs, but I did not mind it at all. I thought it actually fit very well. And then after that helix, you'll pretty much meander into a left banking turn into the final brake run, which is quite long. <laughs> but it's definitely made to fit three trains stacked as well. And there was only one day that we ever saw three train operations where we actually were able to ride. But with that, you will exit out the same side you entered and go down a set of stairs into the gift shop. But man, Gatekeeper was definitely a ride that surprised me. I've never heard incredible things from a majority of the community. It's actually quite split from what I've seen. A lot of people think it's really good and a lot of people just hate it for some reason. I'm definitely in the love camp for sure. Gatekeeper was one of my favorite rides of the entire trip. And even though it technically might be a B tier coaster at Cedar Point, if you put this at pretty much any other Cedar Fair Park, it would be one of the best rides at the park. This might be unpopular, but if you put it at Knott's, it would be my second favorite ride at the park. I really loved it that much. It is legitimately my second favorite B&M coaster. Maybe that's just because I haven't been on any other wings, but heck, my favorite B&M coaster is a flying coaster and I've only been on one of those. But in all honesty, Gatekeeper really reminded me of Tatsu in a lot of ways, especially with its layout being quite sprawling and quite graceful. And especially with some of the elements that it housed felt a lot like Tatsu's, except you're sitting upright instead of in a laying position. But Gatekeeper is definitely a ride I want to go back for just to get a quick marathon every couple years if I can. But it's definitely not a ride that I would be like, hey, I need this in California right now. Of course, a wing coaster in California would be very welcomed by me, but this definitely isn't a ride where I'm like, I need this every week. But it is also one of two rides that I ended up buying a nano coaster for, but that was mainly on Hunter's request, but I'm totally glad that I ended up getting the nano coaster for Gatekeeper because it is legitimately one of my favorites, beauty-wise as well as ride-wise. But now it's time to move into my ratings, and I have four different ratings for rides, which is a little weird, I'd say, but one is a ski slope rating, seeing how experienced you should be before actually riding this ride. One is a five-star rating for intensity, one is a five-star rating for fun, and then I have an overall score out of 10. But starting off with the ski slope rating, I would say this is definitely a black diamond you should definitely be an experienced coaster rider at that point. Definitely don't make this your first looping coaster, if anything. And it does have some quite intense sections as well as being quite tall. And you definitely realize how tall it really is if you're in the front right seat getting some hang time for a good two or three seconds. And that actually kind of reminds me of full throttle at the top of the loop. But I would actually rate this four stars for intensity and that's just because i was mainly graying out in two separate sections of the ride that's right i was graying out in the first drop as well as in the helix at the end of the ride which i was not expecting that now of course the ride is super graceful but there are just certain elements on the ride that are definitely more intense than a lot of the other elements at some parts of the park but this ride is definitely about the positive g's and not the negative g's but I'd also give this a four star out of five rating for fun. It just has some amazing graceful elements and just the flow of the ride itself is impeccable. And I can really get why it's viewed as an icon at the park in all honesty. But moving on to my personal overall rating for this ride out of 10, it's definitely a nine out of 10. This is 
technically a B tier coaster at the park, but in my mind, you put this at any other park and it would be one of the best rides at the park, no, no question. This ride was definitely one of my biggest surprises the entire trip. But I'm really interested to see where you guys think I would rank Gatekeeper out of all of the coasters at Cedar Point. Now, of course, I don't like this as much as Maverick, as you can tell by the overall score. But I think Gatekeeper would be easier to marathon, in all honesty, just because it's not as crazily intense, where you need to catch your breath at the end of the ride. Whereas that definitely seemed to be Maverick for me. But man, Gatekeeper, in my mind, is actually a little underrated. And I'd really love to see a wing coaster come to California eventually. And in all honesty, I'd love to see another wing coaster come out in general, because it has been quite a while since the last opened, at least in the United States. And I really can't wait to get on some other wing coasters like Thunderbird and even X-Flight, because I think I'd enjoy those rides a heck of a lot. But let me know what your feelings on Gatekeeper are down in the comments below. I'm really interested to see what you guys think about the ride itself, because I know this is definitely a ride that can cause some controversy with whether you like it or you hate it. But make sure to let me know if you've ridden it and what you think. And also make sure to subscribe if you haven't, because we're going to have tons of reviews from the bigger coasters at Cedar Point in the following weeks, as well as an overall ranking list in a couple weeks' time once I've reviewed a majority of the bigger rides that I definitely feel need a review. And of course, we're going to have tons of updates from Southern California parks all year long. So make sure to stay tuned for some updates on the 2020 dive coaster at SeaWorld San Diego, as well as at Disneyland and with West Coast Racers especially. But thank you so much for watching if you've watched the entire thing, because I know it went longer than it should have yet again. But that just definitely seems to be how I review things in depth. But until next time, we'll see you on the next ride. <laughs>